Hello. This, the second video on orbital overlap and molecular orbitals, describes how symmetry in shape, bond distance, and differences in electronegativity affect the overlap of atomic orbitals. And it also introduces non-bonding molecular orbitals. Using the examples of HF and LIF, we see how MO theory can describe bonding in both covalent and ionic materials. Again, the video is aimed towards providing a conceptual understanding of MO formation. It's presented at a level I think is appropriate for a sophomore taking an introductory material science and engineering class. And if you want more details on atomic orbitals or the mathematics and extension of MO theory to solids, down in the video description you'll find some uh, links and ideas uh, for other videos that you could look at. Good luck. What factors affect the overlap of atomic orbitals? First, let's take a look at the effect of the symmetry, the shape and orientation of the constituent atomic orbitals. Well, for bonding, and conversely anti-bonding combinations, we must have the correct geometry to make bonding and anti-bonding overlaps possible. In the example shown, I'm showing the so-called sigma overlap of an s orbital and a p orbital in this orientation. Here we can see the symmetry, the orientation of the p orbital, is such that we will get in-phase overlap between the two. So for example here, as the s overlaps in-phase with this lobe of the p orbital, they will do so constructively. And that will yield in the orientation shown, a bonding molecular orbital. And then I could either change the phase of the S or just switch the orientation of the P and I would get the corresponding less stable anti-bonding combination. Here's the example that we have shown before where two P orbitals in the orientation shown are clearly compatible with bonding interactions as they approach in this orientation, here I will get in-phase sigma overlap, and then I can change the orientation of one of them to get the anti-bonding combination. Symmetry is also important for pi overlaps. While we won't go too much into the details of pi bonding, suffice it to say it results from when we have, if you like, a side-by-side -side overlap of, in this case, two p orbitals. And so here, as these two p orbitals on the different atoms with the orientations shown, as they overlap, they will overlap constructively in this lobe and also constructively in this lobe, and the result will be a bonding, more stable, pi molecular orbital. I could then flip the orientation or the phase of one of the pair, and then I'd get the corresponding outer phase overlaps and the anti-bonding molecular orbital. We can also get so-called non-bonding combinations. And again, this is dependent on the shape and orientation of the two atomic orbitals. Here's an example where we have an S orbital overlapping again, if you like, side by side with the P orbital in this orientation. In this case, we see any constructive overlap between the two in this region here, blue and blue, or plus phase and plus phase, that will be constructive interference and stabilization. However, that comes with an equal amount of outer phase overlap, or destructive interference, as this lobe overlaps with the S. The degree of overlap in the two regions is identical, and so we get absolutely nothing in the end. The in-phase and outer-phase overlaps are equal, and therefore the energy of the resultant molecular orbital is the same as that of the two atomic orbitals, which is why we call it a non-bonding combination. Here's another example where a PZ overlapping with a PY. They can overlap, but again, from the symmetry, from the geometry, Hopefully it's clear that the degree of positive in-phase overlap in this region would be accompanied by an equal amount of outer-phase overlap in this region. The net result is no gain or loss in energy, 
a non-bonding molecular orbital. Another factor that affects the overlap of atomic orbitals is the distance, the bond distance between the atoms. Let's consider two identical atoms. How do I know they're identical? Because I've drawn their constituent atomic orbitals at the same energy level. And the distance between the two nuclei is the interatomic separation. Here I'm showing an sp3 hybrid orbital. Let us not concern ourselves too much with that, but you should have seen these before in freshman chemistry. The key point being that the setup, the orientation of this hybrid orbital on one atom and the hybrid orbital on the other is as they approach, they should give in phase overlap. But let's say they're this far apart. Clearly, the distance is far greater than the radial extent of the atomic orbitals, and there is, in this picture, no actual overlap, and therefore there would be no change in energy of the orbitals that result from this situation. Now let's bring the two atoms together, and we see here there's a small degree of overlap between the two orbitals. That would result if it was an in-phase overlap, which is the one drawn by a small degree of stabilization of the bonding MO, and conversely for outer phase overlap, a corresponding small degree of destabilization of the anti-bonding MO. Now we'll bring the two atoms in even closer. So now the bond distance is shorter than those previously shown. What comes with that is a greater degree of overlap. Both good overlap to give me strong bonding and a good energetic stabilization of the bonding MO, and conversely, a much larger destabilization of the anti-bonding MO. So we can see the splitting, the energy difference between the bonding and anti-bonding MOs for this simple example is intimately related to the bond distance. The larger separation, the less overlap, the smaller the sigma-sigma star gap. Another factor affecting the atomic orbital overlap is the relative energies of the constituent atomic orbitals that are going to be doing the overlapping. So until now, we've considered examples where the initial energy of the two or atomic orbitals is the same. But now let's consider heteronuclear examples where the two atoms are different. And here we'll consider, if you like, an extreme case. The case of hydrogen fluoride, where we know Z effective of fluorine is far greater than Z effective of hydrogen. Let us start by looking at the relative energies of the atomic orbitals of hydrogen and fluorine and see if we can figure out what can possibly overlap with what. So for hydrogen, we're considering the 1s, and we know it contains one electron. Well, from the Bohr model, we could calculate the energy of the atomic orbital. It is minus 13.6 eV. For fluorine, the energies of the orbitals are more stabilized. Why? Because they have a higher ZF. And so now, if I depict the energy levels of the fluorine 2Ps and the fluorine 2S, I could calculate their energies from their effective nuclear charges. And in fact, the fluorine 2p lies at minus roughly 19 eV, and the fluorine 2s is far more stabilized. It lies at minus 46 eV, more than 30 eV more stable than the corresponding hydrogen 1s orbital. And so if I'm the fluorine 2s orbital, I'm not sure I want to be bothering overlapping with an orbital that's 30 eV higher in energy. And it doesn't. There is no interaction between the hydrogen 1s and the fluorine 2s, even though they have a symmetry compatible with overlap because their energies are so different. And so actually the fluorine 2s has nothing on the hydrogen to overlap with. And it doesn't overlap at all. It just remains as a fluorine 2s atomic-like orbital and it stays at the same energy. And so now if I depict the energy levels of the different MOs, in this particular case, it's a non-bonding MO because it hasn't overlapped with anything. 
However, some degree of interaction is possible between the fluorine 2p orbital and the hydrogen 1s. Let's look at the px orbital oriented in this direction. Hopefully you can see that this px orbital on fluorine is geometrically compatible for overlapping with the hydrogen 1s, both in phase and, as I'll show in a second, out of phase. And indeed they do overlap in phase to form a sigma 1s 2px MO and a sigma star where I get the out of phase combination. However, the energy of this resultant MO is far closer to the original fluorine 2p orbital than it is to that constituent hydrogen 1s atomic orbital. I'm then left with the two remaining fluorine 2p orbitals, pz and the py. Now we can see in this case the orientation, let's take the pz here, the orientation is such that if there is any overlap with the hydrogen 1s then it will produce a non-bonding orbital because any in-phase overlap will be equaled by the out-of-phase overlap as we discussed previously. The same will be true for the Py and the hydrogen 1s. Again, there will be no change in the energy because the in and out of phase overlaps are equal. The result will be two orbitals which are non-bonding and therefore the same energy as the original fluorine 2p. Now let us fill the MOs with the electrons. We see that the hydrogen 1s electron is effectively transferred into this orbital. And this orbital here, the sigma 1s 2px, as we said previously, is very closely associated with the fluorine energy level. So effectively, the hydrogen electron is being transferred to a fluorine type orbital. Let us take a look at the boundary surface diagram of that orbital. It is shown here. We'll blow it up. The boundary surface diagram in this case is not equally distributing the electron probability density around hydrogen and fluorine. There is a far greater probability of finding the electron around or in the vicinity of the fluorine nucleus. This is consistent with the energy of this orbital being very closely associated with that of the constituent fluorine atomic orbital. Because the BSD is larger around fluorine, the electron effectively spending more time around fluorine, we can think about this as reflecting a partially negative charge around the fluorine atom and a partial positive charge around the hydrogen. So as I mentioned, effectively the hydrogen 1s is being transferred to F. And in the extreme, that would give us H plus. F minus. So here we can see that the MO approach, which is often associated with covalent bonding, can in fact be applied to more ionic materials. But this bonding picture gives us a much more realistic view of where the electrons are and what they are doing. So in this case it's not a question of that electron that has been transferred to fluorine spending all of its time on fluorine, there is some time, or there's some probability of it being around the hydrogen. So really it's not H plus F minus, it's H delta plus F delta minus, though the value of delta could be approaching 1. Let us extend this to a well-known ionic type of material, lithium fluoride. Is it ionic? Is it covalent? Or both? So if we look at the electronegativities, the electronegativity of lithium is far less than that of fluorine. Delta chi is equal to 3, and we would certainly, at first glance, describe this as an ionic material. As a result of these different electronegativities, the energies of the atomic orbitals that could be overlapping are also very different. So the lithium 2s is far greater than the energy of the fluorine 2p or 2s orbitals, and it's quite similar to the HF picture. Here lithium 2s is about minus 5.5 eV, 
the fluorine levels as they were before for HF. So we would get a picture of the orbital overlap in a lithium fluorine bond that was very similar to that we just saw in HF, with that lithium electron ending up in this molecular orbital, which is very similar energy to the fluorine, and therefore primarily fluorine character. The boundary surface diagram would look something like this, again similar to that HF orbital, much fatter, much higher probability density around the fluorine, not as much around the lithium. And so the BSD is telling us that the electron is spending most of its time around the fluorine and it's approaching F minus. And again, that lithium 2S is effectively transferred, but in reality, not completely so. We could calculate the percent ionic character from this formula, from the different electronegativities of the two atoms. We could apply this formula to three different cases, the fluorine-fluorine F2 molecule, HF, and LIF. Now, of course, for F2, where the two atoms are the same, we get a perfectly covalent bond with equal distribution of the BSD around both nuclei, and the ionicity is equal to zero. Using the electronegativities for H and F, we would calculate 59% ionicity for HF. And for this lithium fluoride case, we would calculate an ionicity of 89%. So it is ionic, but 89% is not 100%. There's 11% if you like covalency. And the realistic picture of the bonding is that portrayed by this boundary surface diagram for this particular bonding orbital.